even though on the one hand, you know, we think anybody who does a handwritten will, which is called holographic, that's the phrase that the court system uses, holographic wills. Even though she she wrote this out and we associate that with something that's done on the fly, you know, generally you think when it's done that way, it's because somebody's either given very little thought to it or mm-hmm. did it in a hurry or both. And this case, it looks like it was pretty thoughtful. So here you have this wealthy person, I just can't get over it, who's, who's <laughs> writing out by hand 14 pages, and I'm still scratching my head. Life's Third Act is a podcast dedicated to helping you get the most out of your retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, attorney CPA Joe Cordell features guests each week to discuss prominent topics for those over 55. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Life's Third Act. We're going to continue what we've been doing in a series here, and we've done just occasionally in the past, is to use the opportunities of people that are famous or In some cases, I guess we've had some infamous people, but in any case, they provide great learning opportunities, sometimes positive examples, meaning they've done things correctly in terms of their estate planning and whatnot, but in other cases, maybe strong warnings, and that's really more often the case than not. Incidentally, those cases are more interesting, too. So there is something that that I think is... um, a little voyeuristic when you're talking about estate planning. It's kind of like talking about divorce, actually. And there, we all have a curiosity about the rich and famous, about you know how they manage their money, maybe family dynamics and stuff. So, so I think this example this week you will find interesting as well as educational. How many of you have heard of Aretha Franklin? Now, I'm confident 100% of your hands went up. Unless maybe you were born after the year 2000, uh, in which case I'm wondering why you're watching this show. Uh, Marley, I won't ask you when you were born. But anyway, <laughs> so Marley, though, has done the research on this, as she so diligently does in preparing, for, helping us prepare for this show. So um, it turns out that Aretha Franklin, as I think you'd probably know, she died. She died in 2018. But you may not know what kind of went on in the background with her estate and whatnot. I didn't see this highly publicized. No, no. I think it just came to light over the last couple of years. Um, I think the family kind of kept it under wraps because it was such a, you know, a big thing that was happening to them. And um, it definitely divided them for a little while. Yeah, yeah. And notoriously, you know, estate issues often do. Uh, They're not as bad as divorce, but they can be. Uh, So there was a little bit of that in this case, too. So we'll go ahead and set up the scenario, and then we'll talk about some of the issues. We'll talk about what are the object lessons from, from this discussion. And I think you'll find it interesting. So why don't we start with your giving us kind of an overview, Marley, of of her death and her family situation at that time. Yeah. So um, Aretha Franklin died in 2018. Of course, you know, we all know her as um, American singer, songwriter, pianist. She's famous for a lot of different things. Uh, Blues Brothers. Yes, as you yes. were saying. Yeah. You've, you've probably not seen Blues Brothers. Um, I have seen it. I didn't watch it all the way through, but... I'm not surprised. <laughs> I remember that scene that she was in, but I definitely know her song Respect. Um, mm-hmm. and um, That may have been her biggest hit, you think? I definitely think so. And then I Say a Little Prayer was pretty big, too. I remember that one. Um, I, my yeah. mom played it all the time. She loves that song. So yeah. that was, you know, part of my childhood. <laughs> and and it bears it bears pausing to tell people who don't know this, many of you do, she was big. I mean, she's won all sorts of awards, yes. Grammys, as well as Rolling Stone regularly rates top blues singers in a female category and male category in more than one year. Yeah, she's she, been twice. Num- twice. Twice, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like number one or in the top 10. So she really was a mega star. Uh, it's just that that I think that many people didn't weren't as familiar with her because she was she was less about what was a commercial success. She had those, such as the one you mentioned. Yes. But behind the scenes, she was an artist artist, mm-hmm. meaning that, you know, she was the one that that may have had less income in some years than some of her peers. 
but she commanded the respect of everybody in the industry. Yes, yeah. and I, I think she just truly loved what she did, so money wasn't necessarily an object to her when she yeah. was doing it. I think she was just very passionate about music and singing and everything. Because, I yeah. mean, she even included her sons in the band. Um, a lot of them went on to be producers, singers, guitarists, all kinds of things. Strong roots are essential for a healthy tree, especially your family tree. That's why you work hard to take care of your family every day. At Tucker Allen, we know that taking care of your family means planning for the future. Our team provides personalized estate planning to help you protect your family, your legacy, and your future. From wills and trusts to long-term care and estate planning, count on Tucker Allen. Personalized estate planning made simple. She passed in 2018, um, which left her four sons, um, Keith Franklin, Edward Fl- Franklin, Clarence Franklin, and Ted White Jr. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, with her with her estate. Um, and they actually named Sabrina William, or excuse me, Sabrina Owens as um, the executor of the state to kind of, you know, cover all of that stuff. But what they didn't know is that while they thought there was no will, um, there actually was two that they discovered in May of 2019. One was written in 2010 and it was hidden in a cabinet and one was written in 2014 and it was found in the pages of a notebook um, inside of couch cushions. I mean, this is... (laughs) Now, you know, if we had made this up, somebody would say this is going too far, but I mean... It's like a movie. You just shake your head, (laughs) don't you? Because she was somebody who, even if she didn't have a whole lot of assets, we'll talk about that in just a minute, she certainly had earned a whole lot of money, mm-hmm. and she had had the best of professionals, I'm sure, serving her throughout her life yes. because she made a ton of money. And she also, I think it's kind of crazy, too, because she had a lot of health problems. There was, you know, there was a lot of points that um, she had pancreatic cancer, and that's actually what I she didn't passed know that. from. Yeah. And so I'm assuming, you know, there was a lot of points in that where people would have brought up, well, who does all of this go to? What are we doing with all of this? And I'm not sure the amount of years that she had it. Um, so I can't tell you, you know, if she wrote, I don't, I don't think she um, publicized it until very later on, but I can't tell you if she wrote those, the first 2010 one when she was first diagnosed and then in 2014 changed it. But you would still think she'd go to a lawyer for all of that. You would. Yeah. And your point's well taken. I mean, usually... Often the impetus for estate planning is that somebody gets some sort of diagnosis. And so if it was pancreatic cancer that she died of in 18, you know, that's a pretty long time to survive with pancreatic cancer yeah. if she had it in 10. Mm-hmm. But I would suspect that maybe it was health concerns that triggered it. Um, and you just wonder why was why were professionals not involved? Another mm-hmm. thing that that I still find incredible is that somebody with access to the fame and the professionals that that come with that the fact that this will you haven't mentioned this yet but this was handwritten right yes both of them were handwritten um the 2014 one actually was signed hand signed at the bottom and there was a smiley face in the a <laughs> I mean, you just wonder you you shake your head that that something this important um, was handled that way, and you'd mm-hmm. love to know more of the backstory. But, but the fact is, I guess if somebody like Aretha Franklin can be sitting at home on her couch, or wherever she sat and prepared this, both two different wills, 2010 and 2014, two different wills, both handwritten, and uh, you just wonder how common is it for people watching this show, for example to have prepared a will like that. Mm-hmm. And it's it's amazing to me. I just wonder what is the story? Why did they why did she not make an appointment with a yeah. lawyer? Yeah, and I think she started to take steps because the two thousand ten one was notarized, but there was no witnesses, no lawyer wrote it, um, you know, nothing like that. And I think it's fine to write down your wishes, but you need to take them and do something with yeah. them as well. Yeah, yeah, you're right, to prepare a list for the lawyer. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, let, let's talk a little bit about, before we talk more about the wills themselves, let's talk a little bit about her estate. Uh, how much was there left at the time she died? Yeah, so there was um, 
eight million, I bl- or excuse me, 80 million. Um, but she owed a lot to the IRS, which um, we determined, you know, it was income and estate taxes. So um, throughout the years that this actually all went into probate, they paid out a lot. So um, we'll, you know, we'll share the end results um, when we get to there. But they they paid probably around eight million to the IRS, um, and her estate included both of her homes, um, the one in suburban Detroit, and also the one in Bloomfield Hills. Um, it also included a couple of her cars, all of her furs, jewelry, dresses, um, everything, even um, anything that might come from using her likeness or her music. Yeah, and that's probably where the real money will be, just mm-hmm. like with Elvis's estate, which we've done. I look at a previous show. Um, and and we talk a lot about that, but yeah, I'm guessing that what what the the courts call and what lawyers call intellectual property, which means copyright, uh, trademarks, and things like that. So yeah, I suspect that's where the real value is. So this this is another thing that needs to be called to your attention. Anybody who is doing estate planning, I know a lot of you may not have money that exceeds the exemption right now a an individual is i think we're up to with the latest adjustment close to 14 million dollars now it will be that you will have as an exemption when you die oh here's my dog uh my belgian malinois scout anyway so uh many of you are thinking so it's not going to impact me and if you're married of course you have twice that amount but incidentally, those that's going to expire at the end of 25. So beginning 26, unless it's renewed by Congress, then that's going to drop all the way to, don't hold me to this, I haven't looked lately, I think it drops all the way to a couple of million. But anyway, um, at that point, you're looking at a 40% tax rate. And d- depending on your state, and this is the state of Michigan, so you have state taxes too, not everywhere, but some states. And I think Michigan has a, a, a state tax. So often that's in the form of an inheritance tax, which means it's taxed to the people who get it, as opposed to a state tax, which is a tax on the estate itself, not on the people who get it. But the end result's the same if if the person who ends up getting it gets less because it was taken out of the estate or from them. So you could easily be in a situation where, like like happened here, this could have been planned better. Much better. Could have been much better. And if you think that 40% of the value above the exemption was taken off, and we're talking about, we're told, $80 million originally, um, that's just a lot of money that was needlessly surrendered to the IRS. Now, we're guessing that that's where that went. We don't have all the details about the estate. I mean, you could go to the courthouse and you can research and get most of your questions answered because the nature of estates is public records. But still, there's some things that, that you know you just don't know. And in terms of, of how this tax was ultimately settled, we know that, that part of the income tax that was due, this $8.1 million, mm-hmm was we know that was paid and that i think a large part of that was due to income taxes that were owed that's separate from estate taxes so if this had been planned correctly the 80 million probably could have been the whatever tax was paid associated with that 80 million could have been avoided entirely in all probability with proper planning but it's just you know she was an artist and often often artists musicians and others they they often don't give a lot of attention to that sort of planning. Yeah, and I think another thing about her that we all know is she was very headstrong. So I'm Mm -hmm. sure anybody that she hired, business managers, you know, any type of professional, they probably tried to mention something to her and she's just, I'll take care of it when I I need to. I'll take care of it when I need to. Yeah, that's true too, is Mm -hmm. people don't want to push, you know, or uh, the person they're working for. So I doubt that anybody really kind of, you know, were emphatic to her. This is what you've got to do. I mean, if her personality was as you described, which I would bet, having yeah. seen, seen, yeah. <laughs> seen her perform, I get the the opinion that she was very much in control of her career. Mm-hmm. And 
So tell us a little bit more about the these sons. Uh, wait, same father, different fathers? Yeah, so they have all different fathers. I will have to look at my notes for this because there's a lot. Um, so Keycalf Franklin is also known as Keycalf Cunningham. Um, his father is Ken Cunningham. Um, Edward Franklin, his father is Edward Jordan. Clarence Franklin, his father is Willie Walker. And um, Ted White Jr., also known as Teddy Richard, He, um, his father is obviously Ted White. And, and so one of the children, though, has a handicap or something? Yes, Clarence does. Um, I didn't really dig into that. I, you know, it's not necessarily relevant, but she did have it set up that he was under a guardianship. And in both of the wills, um, she stated that he was to be taken care of no matter what. Yeah, and I think it's some form of mental illness. But mm-hmm. it seemed that all the kids seemed to agree that he needed to be cared for. Yes. Yeah. Um, Well, like I said, we'll, you know, we'll get to this, but in the end, they all agreed to at least that. um, And they wanted to make sure that the brother was definitely taken care for and all of his needs were, you know, looked to. Yeah. And so here's another interesting thing. We we said that both of these wills, the one in 2010 and 2014, that they both were handwritten. But interestingly enough, there was one of the four children that took the position that the 2010 will should govern. And then I think the other three were all three of the position that the 2014 should govern. Yes. um, So White, um, Edward White, was uh, listed on the 2010 will. And actually, Sabrina Owens was listed as with him as well as Uh, co-executors. Yes. Um, And then in the 2014, it changed and listed Keycalf Cunningham um, or Keycalf Franklin as the co-executor executor along with um sabrina owens so this um you may be wondering well who cares who is the co-executor incidentally there probably i think there were some details in it about allocation of assets that were Mm -hmm. a little different so and and we'll talk about that in just a second but but i want want to explain to you why sometimes it's a big deal who gets to be the co-executor is that the court ultimately must approve the executor. Even though it's stated in a will, the court has the ability to conclude that somebody is is not to be trusted or they're not capable. Uh, but it's unusual. It's unusual for the court to override the, the person that, that is suggested to be the executor. Uh, unless there's a significant amount of money or an estate that's going to go on for a long time that has to be managed in some way, like a business, uh, like trademarks and intellectual property, like Elvis Presley's estate. So unless it's something like that, being an executor is always lucrative if there's any assets at all, and the compensation is prescribed by statute in, I think, most all states. Uh, I know a majority of states. So it calls for a certain percentage often of the estate to be the basis of payment. It can be 3%, 4%, sometimes 5% of the value of the estate. If you think about it, you know, depending on how much money is yielded over time through her estate, it, that could be, well, a lot of money. Now, she wasn't as big as Elvis, but no one foresaw that Elvis's estate would produce what it did. No mm-hmm. one, there was no record for that ever happened before. So people in in the latter half of the 20th century suddenly realized that, that fame in the modern world with all these reproductive capabilities in terms of video and digital and analog recordings and all these varieties of way you, ways you can appear online, you know, you can now reproduce uh, someone's likeness in more ways and their sound in more ways than ever before. So this, I think, could turn out to be a lucrative role. Now, I'm not saying that was the sole motivation. There were some differences in the wills, but that was a a driving force. So I, I also want to call your attention the way these wills were done. They were both handwritten. But interestingly, the 2010, you were telling me, was was much more detailed. Yes. So that one was 12 pages um, with a lot more details. And that one included um, Ted White as the executor, Sabrina uh, Owens as the executor. Um, And then in it, it requested that Kikaf and Edward both go to school and get some type of degree or do, you know, business classes or something to be able to um, profit from the estate and be able to have a part in it. It's an interesting requirement. Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard of that before, but... Yeah. Is that yeah? Is that normal in a will, or is that more normal in a trust? In, well, now you know sometimes 
Um, sometimes people will say, I want my child to get an education. Mm-hmm. If they get an education, then they can have more. But this sounds like she wanted them to become capable of managing you know, her estate. Yeah. And I, I think that's odd also because they were older when she wrote that first one, too. I mean, that was only eight years before she passed, so they would have been... 40s, late 30s, probably. So maybe that's the reason they didn't do it, right? Mm-hmm. Apparently they didn't do it. So. Yeah. yeah. They didn't. So that, that requirement was changed, though, in the 2014. That's correct. Um, that one was changed along with the co-executors. There was no mention of that in the 2014. And then it also stated that um, Keycalf would get the Bloomfield Hills home, which when she passed was valued at $1.1 million. But obviously in today's money, that's quite a bit more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of change. Yeah, incidentally, we can double any of the real estate since 2018. Mm-hmm. So I, what interests me, though, is um, is the fact that she, in this 2010 will, took so much care to write out in elaborate detail. And she, she initialed each page, sort of like 14 pages, she initialed each page. So this was, even though on the one hand, you know, we think anybody who does a handwritten will, which is called holographic. That's the phrase that the court system uses, holographic wills. Even though she she wrote this out and we associate that with something that's done on the fly, you know, generally you think when it's done that way, it's because somebody's either given very little thought to it or mm-hmm. did it in a hurry or both. And this case, it looks like it was pretty thoughtful. So here you have this wealthy person I just can't get over it. Who's who's <laughs> writing out by hand 14 pages and I'm still scratching my head. And What's the story? She must have been so detailed about it too because even the 2014 one while it had way less than the 2010, she specified that her gowns could be auctioned or they could go to the Smithsonian. So it's mm. not that she didn't think it through. It's not that she wasn't thinking about it. Right. And that's just what is kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, someone could say that that really she spent more time with her estate planning than if she had <laughs> yes. gone to a lawyer and said, look, this is what I want you to do, go do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so then in 2014, um, she does another will and this one is four pages, right? Mm-hmm. So the four-page will, you can imagine, doesn't have the detail. It also doesn't have the the uh, initials on each page, which you know it's a good way of knowing that there's not been a substitution or something. It it also shows more premeditation. So there wasn't that, and then there was a signature, uh, which, as you said earlier, had a smiley <laughs> yes. face in it. Um, and it, I guess they were both a little hard to read. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, they were both a bit jumbled and not, you know, the greatest handwriting, which not everybody has beautiful handwriting, so that might have just been hers. But um, kind of from the way that they made it sound, it seemed like they were kind of just rushed and, you know, chicken scratch that you just jot out, even though the 2010 was pretty detailed. They both kind of look similar in that sense. So you wonder what was going on at the time that that she did these two wills. But in any case, um, she dies, and the whole family concludes that there is no will. So, and they believe that. And then, as you said earlier, <laughs> th- these will, first of all, they find one will in an, uh, in a not so unlikely place in her home. But then they find the later will. In a pretty unlikely place. Yeah, and I think it's odd. I I don't know. I researched this, but I was trying to figure out what tipped them off to like that there may be wills because they would have had to go through a lot of things. And I don't know if they were moving things out of her home or if they were getting started on some sort of process of just cleaning everything out. But I mean, to go digging around in couch cushions looking for a will is a very odd thing to do. And it's yeah. like you'd have to be looking for something pretty specific. And if the the 2010 will was hidden in the cabinet, you'd probably have to know exactly which cabinet and where to dig for it. Yeah, yeah. I I think that, you know, when you're cleaning out the house, um, and this was months later, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So it was actually in the following year, but less than a year later. And um, I can see how they would find what was in the cabinet. I mean, somebody preparing, clean, doing it thoroughly. Mm-hmm. But the, I agree with you on the couch. The couch. <laughs> you wonder, how did that? So, so anyway, um, there is a trial. There's a trial on this 
with a jury, which you and I were talking about this earlier is, um, you know, is it uncommon to have a jury? Actually, it's not that uncommon to have a jury in probate when you have questions of, of law, excuse me, questions of fact. Uh, where it's where if it's just a question of law, then in those cases, you know, often you know judges will rule from the bench, and judges are also able of to hear questions of fact. You don't have to have a jury. Jury is typically selected by one of the parties, and and that that's almost always the case when you have a jury. You always, as a general rule in the legal system, have the option to have a case tried by a judge, and and in many cases you only have the option with a judge, depending on. The, the the circumstances, the area of law. Um, but if there are questions of fact, uh, then you can have a jury in most states in probate and commonly do. So in this case, the jury listened to the evidence as to which of these wills was valid. And there were arguments for both. You could say as to 2010, it was, you could argue, well, there's more time spent, more premeditation, more thought. But, but and of course you had the, the, the initials, and you could be more confident that it was her that executed it, I guess. Although, um, if you if you fall back on what is the general rule governing wills, this is the the general rule always as to anything relating to estate planning is whatever the latest document that was prepared, unless it was intended to be a supplement, is going to be a replacement. And if it's validly executed, and for holographic wills, you don't have to have the signatures, the witnesses, and all those things that you have to have for other types of wills. I guess the idea is you don't need all those uh, protective devices if somebody's taken the trouble to write the whole thing out. I think that's the reasoning. Uh, otherwise, I think all of our viewers know that you know you need uh, the execution of a will is a very ceremonial thing you have to have it notarized you have to have wi the proper number of witnesses witnessing the proper things um, but in this case because it's holographic all those rules pretty much are suspended but you do need to be sure the person's signature is genuine mm -hmm. and often you'll have somebody who will testify about that so in this case i don't think there was a dispute about her 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 signature being genuine so in this case, you know, though there's more thought put into the first one, the second one uh, was, you know, it was a valid, it was written by her, signed by her, purported to be her complete will. So the law says that that replaces, that invalidates, supersedes the prior will. Now, it's interesting, the judge made a comment to one of the parties, uh, to, the, to the losing party, I guess, um, and that was that they could potentially make a case for the incorporation of parts of the previous will. And I think what the judge is saying is that there, there must have been some vague language mm -hmm. that would suggest what lawyers call in estate planning, you call incorporation by reference. So if you, you can prepare a will and incorporate another document by reference, and that, that makes the other document valid as to that those things referenced uh, without having to have its own independent proper execution signatures and all that. So it's a little un, uh, it's an it's an unusual example of using that theory here. But apparently we don't have these in front of us. But there must have been in the second will something that suggested that she must have thought that people would look back at the previous one maybe for some additional information. It was incomplete as to mentioning some of these things that you mm -hmm. mentioned. And that's what I was wondering also because I think maybe she wrote the 2014 as just, you know, uh, like this is my new one, but anything that I didn't say in this one, it's in the 2010 one. And mm -hmm. so when the judge mentioned that, that's what I was wondering was if he could pull things that weren't even mentioned in the 2014 one from the 2010 one to be able to have those in the new will. Yeah, yeah, incorporated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there is... Uh, um, one approach would have been, and I don't know if this argument was made, would have been to regard the second as a codicil, which is a supplement, to the previous will. In other words, to say the primary will is the previous one, and this one wasn't replacing it. This was intended as a codicil. But if they had done that, then it would mean that the changes she made in 2014 were the very changes that the person objected to who was challenging the will, this second will. So that wouldn't have worked for them to make that argument. So 
the judge concluded that the second will was the will, uh, but oddly enough, there may be some some provisions probably relating to personal property and other mm-hmm. items. I don't think major features. And now I know with trust, you can settle it outside of court. Could they have done the same with this will? They could have. The parties could have come together and reach that agreement. Mm-hmm. The court would have to approve it. Okay. But yeah, it could have been avoided. You know, these, uh, you wonder how close these four yeah, sons are. I, um, I was reading an article and it stated in the end of it that whenever they all went to court, um, the very last time they were pretty just cold to each other. They were sitting up on the same bench and they didn't say a word to each other when they had all been pretty close before. And, you know, the part of me wonders why not just settle, settle it outside of court then if it's going to be such a big thing? Yeah. Because I, I mean, Beyond the Bloomfield Hills home, there wasn't there wasn't much besides the the co-executors and Sabrina Owens. You know, eventually she dropped out because she got tired of um, everything and she resigned from the position. So they could have just both of them could have stepped up and they could have just settled it that way. Yeah, yeah, rather than hire lawyers. Mm-hmm. And so it's a shame, but you know they each had a different dad, so. Uh, you know, you wonder how close were they. That's true. Um, but clearly she had a close relationship with maybe all mm-hmm. of them. And they did all agree about the importance of taking care of Clarence. Yes. Was it Clarence? Yes, Clarence. So, um, yeah, you, you hate to see them. Fight, but but at least now this deal has them all really enjoying an equal share, essentially, of the estate. And maybe the person who wanted to be the executor is not the executor, uh, but you can be sure that he'll be looking over the shoulder of his brother <laughs> that is. Uh, but this is definitely a lesson. This is, you know, it's kind of an amazing story that this could happen with somebody such as this. And doubtlessly, there was waste. Um, one waste we haven't really mentioned here that just bears mentioning is, is just the cost of the litigation. That was in all likelihood paid for through her estate. Mm-hmm. And we don't know how much that cost, but something tells me hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent in that way. Um, and then, of course, we mentioned the taxes that properly planning could minimize, maybe entirely avoid. Often you can entirely avoid these if you plan enough in advance. Um there could have been somebody set up to manage the intellectual property, a proper corporate trustee, which would have been better. Uh, it, you know, you all know who watched this show. I'm a fan of of having professionals manage the money, and one of the reasons is that they have liability insurance, they have lawyers, they have they have people to make sure it's done right because they they know that they're liable if they screw up, and and yeah, they charge you know a couple percentage points maybe or less. But man, in a case like this, that would have been so much better for it to be properly managed Mm -hmm. or even just have a corporate co-trustee. That would have been wonderful because that person, that institution, and another advantage is it's an institution. So it's not just a single person who retires and and suddenly you need to find a new person to run your your affairs. Um, Instead, this institution could have been a co-trustee of somebody that may be more intimately involved. And often that's the balance that that really works. Yeah. And um, the last executor that they had chosen, which was Reginald Turner after uh, Sabrina Owens stepped down, he said that they owed around 900,000 in legal fees. Oh, Um, wow. Yeah. That doesn't, it really doesn't shock me. That's just crazy to me when they could have saved all of that money. And then he stated he, um, at the end of everything, he was like, you know, at the end of it all, the IRS is getting a good chunk of the money and they have to be paid first before we can even do anything with the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. And as to the money that's not already been paid to the IRS, Mm -hmm. I think the latest agreement they had coming out of court, remember the thing about probate is creditors also are part of probate and they have to be paid first. So creditors have an interest in probate proceedings and any order is going to include them in at first in line. And there's no creditor that's more first in line <laughs> than the IRS. The IRS is always first, and then the state and other taxing institutions. So um, this deal was 40 or 45 percent. 45 percent of whatever income is thrown off from her estate until whatever the total balance is that's due has to go directly to the federal government. Mm-hmm. 
and or state. I think it's all federal government. So, I mean, you know, you just shake your head. And and some of you may be thinking, well, I'm glad I'm not rich. <laughs> well, that's not the lesson. I mean, the lesson is that, you know, you can have a whole lot less money and still enough money to where on a smaller scale, these sorts of problems happen. Even if you don't have a holographic will, you know, these sorts of problems can eat up your estate. And even if your estate is substantially less, it's a hundred percent of your life's effort. Mm -hmm. So it, it should be as important to you as hers would be as, as uh, uh, a millionaire or a billionaire's estate would be to themselves. It's still everything. And it represents your efforts and, and you value your children and, and the people you love as much as anybody who's rich or famous. So these lessons are universal. They don't just apply to people. It's just that these are more graphic and they're more entertaining, perhaps, <laughs> than the average person. But but it doesn't change the rules that, that were violated here and that a good portion of you, statistically, are going to violate these rules. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to think that anybody who watches this show defies those statistics. And maybe <laughs> maybe you all do. So so I, uh, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, good work, Marley. Thank you. So uh, we'll continue to look for these opportunities to teach and learn. And this one was really rich with opportunities. Yes. <laughs> okay, this has been another episode of Life's Third Act. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Life's Third Act, a podcast for thriving in retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. Each week, we discuss topics and answer questions to help you better plan for your future. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Subscribe and listen again next week for another edition of Life's Third Act. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.